and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I check out Protect Software. I play some games. I have a chat to Jeff. And I take a look at some books. Let's get on then. Spy Hunter was one of those memorable arcade games. It was released in 1983 by Bally Midway and moved away from the usual platform shooting or racing games. It sort of merged racing and shooting to provide a challenging game. Originally planned to be a James Bond tie-in, that was dropped and it became Spy Hunter instead. You had to drive along a road, avoid or shoot the enemy vehicles, upgrade your weapons, and the skilled player could change their car into a boat by driving into a boathouse and do the same on water. Most micros got a version of this, and the Spectrum was not left out. Released by US Gold in 1985, the game follows the arcade version closely. The plot says you are a world-class spy, but obviously not James Bond, and you are driving your ultra-equipped turbocharged spymobile. The road is crawling with enemy agents, and you have to destroy them or get destroyed. It's as simple as that. The game does have a scrolling road, although the Spectrum scrolling is character-based. This though doesn't detract too much from the game, as you're spending too much of your time trying to concentrate on not getting smashed off the road. The sprites are much bigger than the arcade version, so manoeuvring is sometimes tight. You head off shooting anything that can be shot, and trying to keep on the road. If you don't drive fast enough, things will appear from the bottom of the screen behind you, so you have to keep your speed up. Some cars cannot be shot, and you have to either avoid them, or push them off the road. If you take the correct fork in the road at one point, you will switch to a jet boat, and continue playing on water. If you get far enough, a weapons van will arrive and you can drive into the back of it and upgrade your weapons. And here you can get things like missiles or oil slicks. The graphics are good, large and smooth, but the firing mechanism is a little bit odd. It seems to only fire when you move. It's hard to explain really unless you play it, but I found myself stabbing the direction keys continually to keep firing, despite holding down the fire button. Sound is okay, nothing really special, there's some decent effects in there for shooting and explosions, but that's about it. Difficulty wise, you can choose novice or expert, and in novice mode you get a decent long game that you can really enjoy. I remember buying this when it came out and playing it for ages, even though I hadn't seen the arcade game at that point. I really enjoyed the challenge and the different style of gameplay from everything else that was being put out at that time. It's a good game then, and definitely worth playing. Protech were one of many companies producing joystick interfaces in the early days of the Spectrum. Back then there was a race to define the standard, which was eventually won by Kempston. Other companies produced their own standard in the hope that it would catch on, and these included Full Electronics and Sinclair themselves. Some companies produced interfaces that were compatible with the other ones, and Protech opted for this route, 
despite their early adverts not mentioning this fact. In 1983, they were advertising just a standard interface. No frills, it wasn't programmable or switchable. It was just a single joystick interface. As time moved slowly on, they changed to a larger advert, selling not only the interface, but some games as well, and still no mention of the standard they were using, only that it was compatible with games from companies such as Silversoft, Quicksilver and Ultimate Play the Game. In mid-1983, the advert moved to full colour, and was accompanied by a full colour opposite page, advertising Hunter Killer, another Protect game, and interestingly the tagline, Play the Game, and this was after Ultimate had arrived on the scene. Strangely, the games shown were not all for the Spectrum, some were for the ZX81, but let's check the interface first. The box is nice and I like the design. The instructions are easy to understand, but then again a joystick interface is not exactly complicated. Ok, some are, but that's for another review. There is a single joystick port on the side, and around the back a three position switch. Position 1 emulates the Protec or Cursor joystick, Position 2 emulates the Kempston, and Position 3 is the Sinclair Interface 2. Protec did change the design of the interface over time, and a more recognisable one being this rounded design. The interface works in the usual way. You plug it in, switch on the computer, load a game, in this case Attic Attack, and play away. There's not really a lot more you can say about a joystick interface, so let's move on to the games then. Protec produced only six games for the Spectrum, along with two for the ZX81. They also sold an acoustic modem and a joystick. The games then, let's start with Airliner, and as you can imagine from the inlay, this is a flight simulator. What you don't know though is, this game also appeared as a type-in in your computer magazine in December 1982, named BA111 Simulator. The game is mostly in basic with small machine code parts, and Protec sold this game to the public even though it had been free to type in two years earlier. The instructions are comprehensive though, explaining the cockpit layout and map screen. Onto the game then, and I have to say I don't like flight simulation games and this one doesn't really help improve my thoughts. This game does not have an actual view out of the cockpit, just the instrument panel, which deters me even more. I would have thought that this style of simulation would only appeal to the hardcore sim fans. There are numerous keys that operate throttles, flaps, banking, landing gear, etc, etc, and the challenge is simply to take off and land again. Not as easy as it sounds. As you press various keys to gain speed and eventually take off, the only indication that you are doing something are the readouts, and a small representation of your plane on the ground. Ah, it seems I have taken off. Or maybe not. This game is interesting to a minor section of the gaming community. Sadly, I'm not one of them. Watching dials change does nothing to excite me. Sorry folks. Even following the instructions, I failed to get the plane off the ground. Let's move on then, and Roadrunner. The inlay for this one looks really nice, and suggests a racing game of some type. Can you handle the turbocharged hot rod around the torturous course? Is the claim on the inlay? Let's try it then. Upon loading the game, it seems to be a poor cross between Pac-Man and Amidar. You drive around filling in the lanes and avoiding the ghosts. The graphics are 8 pixel UDGs, and move around in 8 pixel jumps. The sound is terrible, the key response is terrible. The game quickly becomes frustrating because of this. Not really original, and not really worth buying. The best thing about it is the inlay. Next we have Spectropede. Now there's no prizes for guessing what type of game this is, and the inlay does look good. Yes, it's a centipede clone, and there's trouble in the mushroom patch. Again we have pixel graphics, but at least things don't slow down when there's a lot on screen. 
There's full control too, so you can move in all directions. The segments split as expected when shot, and there's a very annoying spider. There's also a Galaxian that appears at one point and starts firing at you. The snail is present, and there's also a strange white worm, and the screen can get very busy. Sound is good, better than the previous games, and it uses some decent machine code effects, and the control is a lot better too. It's actually not a bad version of the arcade classic, it's playable and enjoyable, and so far this is the best Protec game. Now we have Venture. This is a strange game, it's a collection of seven basic games that load one after the other. Now I did a Patreon special about this some time ago. You start with £1,000, and each game will add or take away some money depending on how you play the game. The first game then is Racing, a duck race game. Three ducks racing, OK. You simply pick which one you think may win, and that just ends up being the one that gets the best random number generated time and time again. They move across the screen, and when they reach the end, you either win or you don't. It's not really a game though, is it? Next is Fruit Machine. Now we all know these. Here you have 10 attempts to win more cash. This game differs though, and you have to guess a secret three number combination. Well, you don't actually guess it though, you just stop the numbers and hope for the best. Not very exciting. Next is Treasure Hunt. Now this game hides some treasure randomly on the screen, and you have to enter a grid reference to try and find it. As you guess, a little man digs, and if he doesn't find anything, you will get a hint as to where to go next. This can be over very quickly. In one game it only took me three attempts, and in another it took a lot longer. Next we have Master Code, a game of logic. It's a bit like the board game Mastermind. You have to guess a four digit code, and the numbers in the W section tell you how many numbers are correct, and the number in the R section tells you how many are in the right position, and using logic you have to guess it. I'm not really a fan of these games either. I do find them dull and ugh, just end up pressing random numbers. Now we have Crasher, and here you have to crash into more than a hundred cars. Oh dear. A rather boring game this, with dull graphics and dull sound, and you have to keep going, you can't stop, you have to crash into 100 cars. Next we have Bomber. Really? A Bomber game? A game that you can type in from practically every computer magazine ever written? Oh well. Yes, you drop bombs to clear a path to land. Nothing new here. Mm, move along then quickly. And the final one is Adventure. To get the gold, you have to fight monsters and navigate the maze. 
As you move about in 8 pixel jumps, you can find items such as cheese, what? An aerosol, really? And a fish, hmm. You aim for the gold, but usually find a monster of some kind to fight. And using any items you have collected, you can have a go at them, and the fight sequences are terrible. Once you get to the exit, you are told how well you have done overall. But you can't get out unless you've got the gold, so you're stuck in there forever. If you try to exit with no gold, you have to go back to game 5 and start all over again. Mmm, and that, my friends, is Venture. Moving on to the full-page advert, then, and Hunter Killer. Hunter Killer was supposed to be their killer game, no pun intended. It was heavily advertised, and they went to town on the packaging. It's a really good quality, large box, well-printed, with a really good manual. But was the game any good? As the title suggests, this game is a submarine simulator of some type. Using three views on screen and numerous controls, you have to hunt down and destroy the enemy submarine. Now this is a kind of tactical game. The three views you have are the main control panel that shows you the ballast and speed and direction of your submarine, the periscope view that shows absolutely nothing at the moment because you're nowhere near anything, and the map screen that gives you your position and the last known position of the enemy sub. First thing you need to do is get underwater, so you have to fill the ballast tanks, and as you're doing that you will get notified that you're using a diesel engine which can't operate underwater, so you have to switch to the electric one. Once under, you start steering left and right and moving slowly, avoiding mines, avoiding enemy destroyers, and eventually you will get to the combat zone and destroy the submarine, hopefully, if you haven't fallen asleep. It's a very slow, ponderous game with poor key responses. I can see the attraction here, but the magazines were split over it. The game got a score of 9 in Sinclair user, much to the annoyance of a Spectrum owner who later complained that it was too slow and boring and easy to play. Continuing, it took half an hour to reach the target. Well, I certainly won't be playing it that long. Crash, however, gave it 61%. Interesting fact number one, this game looks very similar to a typing from your computer published in 1983 called U-Boat Hunt. Both games were by the same author, and this is obviously an updated version of that typing. Interesting fact number two. This game can be played in multiplayer mode using Sinclair's Interface 1. So, if you can find somebody who bought the game, who's also got an Interface 1, and is interested in submarine games, then you're all set to have a good game of U-Boat Hunt. Sorry, Hunter Killer. And that was all the games from the advert, and to be honest I wasn't really inspired by any of them. Protech did release another game called Speculator. This was a type of Monopoly game, but with a computer twist. Instead of having money, you had bites and each part of the board was split into some sort of computer-related section. Your program can crash, causing you to lose some bytes. You can buy chips and charge if another player lands on them. And there are a lot of other things too, winning competitions and so on. And each will give or take away bytes. The graphics are simplistic, but it's certainly a different approach to Monopoly. I can see this being entertaining if you had a few lads round for beers and they liked playing Monopoly and liked computers and liked waiting five minutes for it to load. Mm.
And that was all from ProTech. June 1984, and they were still putting out the full-page, full-colour adverts. In late 1984, they had this advert, no games, just interfaces. And the last advert I could find was from January 1985, still advertising just a few interfaces. It seems the company slipped quietly away, like so many others. Okay, so we're going to do some Patreon questions. And we're going to pick some that have got short answers rather than long rambling ones. So let's start with preferred game method, joystick or keyboard? Keyboard, always. Keyboard always, me too. I don't know, I think I, I think you get more of a tactile feel from keyboards when you, when you, you know, if you, especially if you're using QAOP and space or M. I think it's, I don't know, it's, it seems a natural way to control something, whereas a joystick is a bit less um, accurate, I think. Yeah, I prefer joystick now for some games. Oh. But one of the problems with joysticks is they used to come on stuck. The suckers used to come off. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Halfway through a game, but the, the critical moment, usually. Definitely. So let's let's look for another Patreon question. Favourite load, loading slash title screens? That's tricky. There are, there are a lot of them, and I haven't seen them all. Now, I've done my top ten of these. It's, it's going to be my the number, ones. My number one was Ramble. Oh, okay, right, right. I like Trantor, and I like Cobra. And the Batman one was particularly good, if I, if memory serves me right. Yeah, it was. I don't. I didn't have any of those in my my top ten. I think I had Laser Squad in there. I tell you what, I'll come back if I've changed my mind on my favourite one. <laughs> right. Favorite game tunes. Now I've got. The, I know what this one is, and it's a really weird one, and nobody will get it. My favourite tune in a game is on Pud Pud. When it's on the title screen, it plays the same tune, but it plays it like with different beeper engines. And then it starts mi mixing them up, so you'll get one beeper engine, then you'll get a second one, and then it'll mix the two together. And then a third one will just play it on its own, and then the first and the third one will be mixed together. So, I, I, think, I think you had to be there. My favourite is Amarut. It was one of the first one to wear AY chip tunes right. I heard, mm. and I really liked it. It's really atmospheric. <laughs> Next, favourite in game graphics. Oh, that's going to be tricky. I know uh, what I'm going to say. I'm going to say Lords of Midnight. Absolutely really? superb. Oh, yeah, so atmospheric. They looked so good. They're a bit basic, though, weren't they? Yeah, yeah well, they are now. Oh, right. They okay. weren't then. <laughs> uh, Favourite in-game graphics for me changed about three days ago when I was putting together Christmas special. And I picked up a game that was in a 1990 issue of Your Sinclair, or Sinclair, I can't remember which Your Sinclair, and I thought the graphics were excellent. However, I can't remember what the game name is. You'll have to give me a second. <laughs> Find I've, it. I've not, I think it was called ex, ex, was it Exodus or Exile. Yeah. Exile, I think. But the actual total graphics package, it was lots of midnight. They were amazing. That was amazing. But for me, the, all the landscapes look the same, but that's just me being a, a Luddite. Favourite game designers, authors, slash software houses? Mm, well. It's easy for me. The software houses are easy for me. It's all the early stuff. It'd be Quicksilver. It would be Bugbyte. It would be Arctic Computing. Bernie so, Drummond, really good graphic designer for all the 3D stuff. Yeah, soft, the whole lot. Software houses, authors, designers has to be the ultimate crew. Yeah, yeah they're always going to come out top though. Yeah, they're they? always going to. Yeah, they're <laughs> always going to. Authors in particular, Mike Singleton. Are you are you sensing a, uh, a theme here? <laughs> yes. Yeah, Stephen Crowswell. Right. Um, superb. I mean, Starquake is is the best Ultimate game not written by Ultimate, in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Any other? Yeah, quick here's ones? a quick one. Did you ever buy, borrow, steal, or use business software or educational software? No. No. Well, that's that one. Done. <laughs> I tell you what, he's a good one to end on. Why is there so much love for the Specky? Uh, okay, where do we start? It was it was cheap. It was uh, an entry level machine. Lots of people could afford it. It was 
easy to use. There were a lot of free type-ins. The games were cheap. There were a mass, massive amount of different types of games available for it. And you could uh, copy your mate's game. No other single possession I have ever owned has brought me as much uh, happiness. Well, well, there's nothing Don't... else that I've ever ho- owned that I'm still using now. That I've, I, you know, from when I first bought it, even it's a different yeah, it's a different machine. But I'm still playing games on it. I'm still writing games. I'm still doing the Spectrum show. So from 1982, 83, I've got no other, no other possessions or no other thing that I'm still doing now. Me either. And there's it. That's it. That's yeah. the end of the quick fire round. That is the end of the quick fire round. <laughs> <laughs> Astro Blaster was a very early arcade game released in 1981, and it was a simplistic shooter. There have been a few attempts to recreate this on the spectrum, including Quicksilver's same-named Astro Blaster. This, though, is a brand new version, written by Matt Jackson, released in 2019. And I have to say, this is brilliant. The ship looks the same, the aliens look the same, and the gameplay is spot on. You have to destroy the waves of aliens, and at the same time, keep an eye on the heat of your laser. If it gets too hot, it will stop. The aliens appear in different formations and have different movement patterns, dropping bombs as they swoop about. If you have a 1 to 8k machine, the sound is excellent, and the gameplay is brilliant. Every now and again you'll get a meteor storm that you can shoot or dodge, just like the arcade. This really is an excellent version of an old shooter, and I really enjoyed playing this. You don't need in-depth stories, you don't need a load of different keys, you just need left, right and fire. This then is a great game. Go and grab it now. game but two. Yes, this 16k compilation features two arcade clones. Can you guess what they might be? Let's get on to the first one then, and Froggy. Yes, it's a Frogger clone, and not a bad version really. There's a nice little tune that starts the game. There are three lanes of cars and lorries, and of course the river to cross. There are bugs on the logs too, and the diving turtles, which are often missing from Spectrum versions of this game. Sound is used well with two tunes, and although the graphics move in character squares, they look good and represent the arcade machine well. I would presume you all know Frogger and how to play it, but if not, you guide your frog home to the lily pads at the top of the screen. And yes, this frog can't swim, so it has to use the logs and turtles to get across the river. I played this for a while, when I really should have been reviewing it, so let's hope the other game is equally as good. Moving on to Zedman then. Now this is a game with an interesting story. After 
it was released, Atari came knocking at the author's door because it was too close to Pac-Man. And when I say too close, I mean almost identical. As you can see, the graphics are good and do look like the Pac-Man machine. Sound is excellent too, and yes, it sounds like Pac-Man. And gameplay is great, just like Pac-Man. It's no wonder Atari were cheesed off with this. Instead of suing the author though, they asked him to stop publishing the game, make a few small changes, then they released it themselves as the official port. This then is probably the best Spectrum version of Pac-Man, apart from the official one of course, but then again it's really the same game. Control is crisp and everything just feels right. A great game then for Pac-Man fans, and considering it's only 16k, a great achievement as well. from the 80s. No, not the That's Life annual, although looking through this is quite interesting, but moving along quickly. Ah yes, books, that's better, my kind of books. Spectrum books. Yes, there were a lot of them, and which ones you bought really depended on what you were interested in, or, more to the point, what your relatives were interested in you reading. There were a lot of different types of books to be had, educational, technical, programming, etc, etc. Let's take a look at a few though. This is 60 programs for the Sinclair Spectrum, published by Personal Computer News Magazine in 1983. The cover has an image of a game that you're never going to find inside. It's Firebirds from Softech. But what you do get is 60 basic programs to type in yourself, and there's a wide variety of game styles on offer. Let's start with the usual type-in fodder and arcade conversions, or should we say arcade rip-offs. This is Chomper, obviously a Pac-Man rip-off, And this is Defend, yes, obviously Defender. And yes, even Galaxians get a shout. Moving away from the arcade stuff then, and this is Scuba. And lastly, Buzzy B. There are also some educational titles in there, and lots of other things like Mastermind and Battleships, so quite a good haul really, and to save you typing them out, you can download them individually from your favourite Spectrum site, whatever that might be. Moving away from the games, and if you could afford a Sinclair Microdrive, then this book may be on your shopping list. Written by Dr. Ian Logan, a man who knows his stuff, this book, published by Melbourne House in 1983, is packed with information about the system. There are basic details about how it works and how to connect things up, and in-depth information too about all the basic commands you can use. And there's even details about the technical side of things too. There's a chapter about machine code for those advanced users, and overall this is, or should I say this would have been, an invaluable book for any owner. When I got my microdrive, I couldn't afford anything else, so I had to work things out for myself and use the very flimsy and thin book that Sinclair provided. Well, that was a quick look at a few of the many books that were available for the Spectrum, and I'm sure you'll have your own favourites as well. I'll look at more books in another episode.